You are live. Awesome. Okay. We're kicking off our chemistry panel with the amazing Dr. Jane Fromer. She earned her PhD in chemistry at Caltech and she's now a science advisor at Calabra. Dr. Jane Fromer is also the 2020 recipient of the Perkins Medal, which is considered the highest honor given in the US chemical industry. And she's authored over a hundred articles and is the co-inventor um, on over 50 issued patents in the fields of electronically conducting polymers and scanning probes based on tunneling and atomic force. So without further ado, please welcome Dr. Jane Fromer. Okay, am I on? Yep. You're seeing my, uh, my slides. Yep. Diana, you did a great job of introducing me. Can I just hand my slides over to you and will you give my talk? <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Actually, I'm really looking forward to sharing with you today my uh, excitement for what you're doing, uh, particularly in conveying to people who have their whole careers ahead of them, all the opportunities that there are, be it through biological doors, chemistry doors, physics doors, or a combination of those doors. So I hope that by the end of my talk, this slide here no longer confuses you about what are those little triangles doing and those stripes in the background? And you'll be perfectly understanding of the fact those triangles are actually DNA origami and they're on a pattern, an electron beam pattern surface. So let's get started in talking about how chemistry provides the underpinnings to so much of our progress in nanotechnology. As was mentioned, um, that's my talk. <laughs> and I wanna thank Diane again. Okay, so when you talk about nanotechnology, it really does no good unless you can talk about the nanometer. And if you don't know what a nanometer is, then let's define it. It's one thousandth of a micrometer. That won't do very much good for you if you don't know what a micrometer is, otherwise known as a micron. So let's just do a little bit of background work so that you appreciate the scale that we're working on here. We're gonna define a micron in terms of an ant. Now, how is that gonna happen? Well, an ant has a compound eye and it's made up of many segments. And in between those segments, there are these little sensors. And those sensors are about one micron across. So when you hear the word micron in the future, just think of your buddy, the ant, and think of his eyes and think of those sensors and you'll get a sense for how small things are that we're now operating on. But still, a nanometer is one one thousandth of that. And so we're gonna go down yet another three orders of magnitude. Let's do that in terms of relating it to objects that you do know. A uh, human hair is about 100 microns across. And a blood cell is about a tenth of that, around eight microns across. We're still 8,000 times bigger than a nanometer. So what is on the nanometer scale? In fact, molecules are. And what's pictured here is an anthracene molecule, and that's about a nanometer across. So when we talk about nanotechnology, we're talking about a ruler that uses the length scale of molecules like this to measure distances. So that's where the nano part of nanotechnology comes from. The fact that we're building things now on the nanometer scale, a nanometer being one thousandth of a micron, and a nanometer being the ruler that we use to measure molecular dimensions. Sometimes you hear the word angstrom, that's one tenth of a nanometer. Okay, if we're gonna make things very small, how do we know we made them? How do we know we made what we drew in our designs in PowerPoints and on the back of envelopes and on whiteboards? we have to somehow be able to prove that we actually made what we thought we made. And to that end, there's been a line of instrumentation developing in the last 20, 30 years since the 80s that have greatly enabled our being able to see what we make, not only see what we make, but actually use these analytical instrumentations to make things themselves. That family of instruments is called scanning probes and it takes on a multiplicity of names. Sometimes it's called atomic force microscope, scanning tunneling microscopes, magnetic force microscopes, et cetera. People sometimes name them after themselves because people like to do stuff like that. But nonetheless, what they all are not is microscopes, which is to say you think of looking through something with your eye or with light when it comes to microscopes. And these in fact do not use an eyepiece or light. 
the term just ca carried over from scoping out on the micro scale. So a lot of my talk today is going to be data which was obtained with scanning probe microscopes because that's what enables us to see what we've done with molecules to make nanostructures. First, let's take a look at some of these microscopes just so you get a sense of what we're talking about. This is, um, this is there are two atomic force microscopes in this picture being run by one person, very talented people do that. Electrical measurements are being made with this particular configuration of a kind of an electrical force microscope. I'm not able to forward here. Oh, there we go. Um, here's another microscope with Bob sitting in front of it. He is measuring nanoparticles with his microscope. You can see behind Harine, there's this tall stack. That's also an atomic force microscope. She's making biological measurements under fluid and she's watching individual either bacteria or actually smaller bacteria than uh, items such as that. She's looking at components, biological components, DNA strands in particular. And finally, here's Gabriella sitting in front of yet another atomic force microscope. The take home lesson to this slide is that we're not talking about huge ultra high vacuum chambers. We're talking about instruments that you can operate out in the atmosphere, out in a room. And you can operate them actually with fluids. You can operate them under gas, under air, in electric fields and magnetic fields. They really take on a lot of different environments to give you a lot of different properties, information. Okay, back to chemistry. This is typically how molecules are represented. We have shorthands, we have space filling molecules, that little Lego toy in the upper left. Sometimes in that design you see on the right, we don't even draw all the atoms in, those zigzags are, chain, are chains of carbon. But nonetheless, this is how we chemists envisions atoms bonded to each other, be they carbons bonded to each other, or carbons bonded to nitrogens, oxygens, chlorines, or, as are shown here. These are all representations of molecules. What do they really look like? Well, let's use, in fact, a scanning tunneling microscope to see what a molecule looks like. And so this will be data that we obtain real time of real molecules, and we're going to show you these with the class of molecules called liquid crystals. First of all, how does the instrument work? You, have, you put your sample on a surface or the, the surface is your sample and you run a very sharp needle over it. That's conducting and your sample is conducting as well or sitting on a conducting surface. And what you're monitoring is the current between that tip and that sample as you raster it across your sample. Let's put some liquid crystals on that surface and repeat this scanning motion. And as we scan over, we're measuring current. And that current is translated into height. And through some clever graphics, we print out what you see here on the right, which are the actual pictures of the molecules. Can you see my, my, um, sen my, <laughs> my sensor here? We have in the picture four or five molecules and bundles before dislocation. In the actual scanning tunneling microscope image, you can see the, the molecules indeed bundled together as four. Four more molecules, four more molecules. What are we looking at in these clouds? Well, what we're seeing is a biphenyl group in this brighter blob here, and we're seeing alkyl chain tails coming off of the molecules here. So in fact, we can see carbon by carbon by carbon in the chain individual atoms that make up the molecules. But even more remarkable, what we're seeing for the first time with this tunneling microscope is the form, the format that these molecules take on interacting with each other as they sit on a surface. That's something that's very difficult to see because normally when you look at materials, you're looking at an assembly or an averaging of them. Here we're looking at the very last layer of molecules as they sit on a surface. Uh, little factoid, liquid crystals, how do they work? They align themselves, as you can see, and that alignment changes as a function of applying a bias, an electrical field to them. And it changes their alignment and allows different amounts of light through. Okay, so that was scanning tunneling microscopes, which rely on a tunneling current between two conductors, a conducting tip and a conducting sample or a sample on a conducting surface. Most materials that we looked at are not conducting. 
So the instruments got diversified in order to look at all sorts of other kinds of molecules. And the materials we're going to look at today are called organic thin films, and they're made by a technique called langmuir blodgett technique, and they stand up on a sample on a substrate. Now, in this particular organic thin film, we've mixed together some fluorocarbons and some hydrocarbons and asked the question, when you put two materials together in solution, how intimately do they mix? Molecule by molecule, group by group, thousands of molecules by thousands of molecules? Well, and how do we know? How do we figure that out? We're going to use this particular atomic force microscope to figure that out. And here's the tip of an atomic force microscope. Unlike the scanning tunneling microscope, it doesn't have to be conductive. So how do we measure its interactions with the surface, those interactions being repulsive and attractive interactions. In fact, we attach that tip to a beam. We call this beam a cantilever. So every time you have an attractive force interaction, this beam tips down and subsequently a beam of light on the back of it deflects onto a photo detector and shows us that there's been an interaction here through a deflection there. Likewise, if there's a repulsive interaction that the beam moves back and there's a deflection on the cantilever in the opposite direction. Now this cartoon here doesn't do justice to just how sharp that tip is. Here it is in real life. It's made out of silicon using semiconductor techniques to create these tips that typically terminate at about 10 nanometers in cross section. 10 nanometers is bigger than a molecule. You might recall that. Uh, a molecule is one nanometer or less, at least small molecules are. So instead of looking at single molecules, typically with atomic force microscopy, we're going to look at a molecular community. In other words, how groups of molecules behave on the nanoscale. Here's that scanning motion going over the molecules, line by line. And what results from it is how those molecules separated on the surface. Okay, do we put smiley faces down in, on the surface? No, of course we don't. I hope you got a bit of a smile from that yourself. What's the scale here? So this image here is about five microns across. What we see are dark islands in a light sea. Those dark islands are the hydrocarbons because they're taller, we can measure the height, than the surrounding sea, which is the fluorocarbon. So now we know that the way that these two molecules separate when you make a mixture of them and then put them down on a surface, and that's very important because the surface sometimes does control how they blend, is as circular islands of hydrocarbons in a continuous sea of fluorocarbons. Okay, that wasn't obvious from other techniques. The reason I chose this picture, this example with the smiley faces is indeed, these did not spontaneously smile at you. Instead, what we did is we went back in and used the stylus of the atomic force micro microscope, not only as a recorder of information, but also as a manipulator of the surface. So in other words, we went in and we gouged out, ooh, that doesn't sound good. We created these features by increasing the force to remove molecules in these places here. So these instruments can both be recording devices and they can be manipulating devices. That's, you'll see a lot more examples of that. Okay, so this kind of news, we can now see single molecules on a surface. How does the rest of the scientific community take news like that? Here's an example from Nature. The date here is rather small. It's 1988 when we first announced that you could see organic molecules one by one on a surface. Now, this was our idea of an organic molecule, dioctyl phthalate, in fact, that we put on graphite. And we not only could see that we had a feature on the surface that roughly corresponded to a molecule, but we also knew that by changing the bias, the voltage between the tip and the sample, we could change this. It looked like we were cleaving off parts of it. We might have been cleaving a single molecule. We might have also been changing the interactions between the molecule and the surface. But nonetheless, we could see this feature respond to the presence of the tip and the bias we were applying. Did I convince you this was a molecule? Well, frankly, we weren't totally convinced either, but to get to that point, we came to this image you see right here a year later. We really needed to put down unambiguous molecules on the surface. So there was no doubt about our just having a blob on a surface. And here you see that liquid crystal picture you saw before. You see how the molecules align. You see how the hydrocarbon tail differentiates from the 
biphenyl head group. And so there's really no ambiguity in this image anymore. We can say with great confidence now that indeed we are directly imaging organic molecules using scanning tunneling microscopy. A little bit perplexing because usually organics are insulating. So it wasn't totally clear why we were getting imaging images, such clear images from molecules that were insulating, but that's the subject of another talk. Finally, a few years later, we then started to use that atomic force microscope that I mentioned before. This is that similar image that you saw before, but it's rendered in 3D. The point here is to say that we're, again, not just imaging or gouging as we did before, but because we're now using a modulated lever to collect these images, we can measure the mechanical properties of the surfaces. So I can measure the elasticity of this hydrocarbon island as being quite different from the elasticity of the surrounding fluorocarbon floor, or the, the friction of this surface being very different from the friction of this background or adhesion. There's many different properties you can measure with a, a mechanical device like that. And it's particularly powerful when you can now do it on the nanometer scale. By the way, any of you who might know that a Teflon pan is coated with fluorocarbon would probably say your friction measurements show this fluorocarbon in the surroundings here to be of lower friction than the hydrocarbon. Nope, that's not what we observe. We observe the opposite. And that's the wonder of working on the nanoscale with nanoscale techniques. And again, that's the subject of a, another lecture or else send me an email. Okay, uh, Professor Colvin will be talking in a couple sessions after mine and she might be bringing up some of her magnetic material. So I'm gonna just briefly introduce one other embodiment of these uh, scanning probe instruments that can measure different properties besides elasticity, adhesion, or placement of molecules, and that is magnetic properties. So magnetic recording disk, which we don't have too many of in your laptops anymore, but or in your telephones using solid state now. But in the day, we did have magnetic recording disks, which had on top of their magnetic layer, a carbon overcoat to protect it so you wouldn't lose data. And the recording head would write bits to that magnetic layer as ones and zeros. A magnetic force microscope was developed. Here it's just being used in topography mode. So this is a view of that carbon overcoat on the magnetic recording disk. It's 10 micron by 10 micron, micron view. It's pretty amorphous, nothing really to write home about. But if you coat that tip with a magnet, and that's what that red tip shows, and you polarize that magnet, then what you're now imaging is no longer that surface topography, but you're imaging the ones and zeros the bits of the disk that lie underneath that carbon coating. In other words, you have customized this instrument, this exquisite measurement device to measure the magnetic poles of features. Where that has particular utility these days is in uh, magnetic nanoparticles used in therapies, also possibly used in memory devices or storage devices. In other words, can we store information in each of these nanoparticles as a one and a zero, as opposed to relying on a magnetic hit head writing bits? Another lecture. <laughs> Let's go back to that opening slide and go a little bit into its background. It, this is being used as an example of how we use chemical forces both to create nano objects and to put them where we want them to be. This is the result of a collaboration between Caltech and IBM Research. Paul Rothman, a colleague at Caltech, created a field, or actually he contributed to a field that was also created at NYU called DNA origami. And DNA origami is taking a single strand, in this case of viral DNA, and folding it up in a manner of your design. And these are some of the designs that Paul created. And the way that he keeps this design intact, holds it together, is what, with what he calls staples. There's red and green and blue and yellow staple. Those are artificial constructs that he programs such that it binds with the sequences of the two domains that you want to hook together. Read this article here if you want to read more about this stunning work. It's really beautiful work. Paul, great job. You created all these items that are about 100 nanometers across. But A, how do you know you created them? And B, how do you find them? And what do you do with them? And to that end, there's a lot of lithography work being done in the semiconductor industry, which 
pattern surfaces. It creates patterns and surfaces, usually with light, but also with a electron beam. And here's a surface that was created on a silicon wafer that had carbon put on top of it. It's a five micron surface. And it was e-beamed with little triangle docking sites across it. A solution of those DNA origami triangles were exposed to it under the right conditions. And almost each docking site was then filled with a DNA triangle. So this answers the question of how do we work with these? How do, we can't reach into this flask here and pull out one of these triangles with a tweezer. So instead we have to customize this surface on the right length scale of these objects and capture them in that manner in the places we want them to be. Well, in fact, if we blow this up, you'll see there's been more of a capture going on. There's actually a directionality to the capture. This row of DNA triangles are all pointing down and this row of DNA triangles are all pointing up. So we have now been able to both capture and orient the DNA. And by the way, you're probably thinking of, well, these holes, I could have rolled marbles across this surface and it would have stuck in the holes. Well, in fact, these holes aren't very deep. What they are is of different chemical composition. This dark bottom of the hole is a different chemical species than this top carbon one, and it's much stickier to the DNA. So what you're really seeing here isn't so much a marble falling into a hole as it is chemi chemistry specific adhesion of the DNA to that darker bottom surface. Okay, these little triangles. So again, this question of great job, Paul, with DNA origami, but why would you want to do that? What, what are you going to do with these? Well, the fundamental philosophy behind it is to show that we can do it, to show that we can controllably manipulate materials on this side, size. But to go ahead, you can think in terms of these DNA origami in and of themselves acting as a chip for other chemistry, for other interactions between molecules. So take one of these 100 nanometer by 100 nanometer DNA origami where we know exactly the sequence of the DNA because that's what Paul programmed. So we know what chemical functionalities are hanging off of this. And let's go ahead and further functionalize the DNA and each of the vertices of this triangle with what we call a sulfhydryl or a mercaptan group. And we just put three into these three sites. And sulfur has a great affinity for gold. And so in fact, when we now expose these DNA triangles that have the sulfur on each corner to gold nanoparticles, we very specifically attach gold particles to each of the three corners. So you can say that what we have created here is a little nano object, an item that has three gold, atoms are actually clusters at spaced 100 nanometers apart at each of the vertices. If we can do this with gold nanoparticles, you can imagine My that- apologies. I couldn't hear what you said. Sorry, that was my Google watch talking to me. <laughs> I should put her to bed. That's, that's nanotechnology too, that I can wear a computer on my, uh, my sleeve, huh? Okay, so back to our DNA triangle. Our, you can see that we have now devised a manner in which we can place small gold cluster, clusters equidistant from each other. Moving along to other materials that have been very popular in creating nanostructures are polymers. Polymers are long chains. You can think of them as a chain. You can think of them as a string of beads made up of links. And each link is typically the same as the one beside it, unless you do a little bit more creative work. In this case, it's a chain of, I'll call them red monomers. And this is a chain of blue monomers. Uh, here we have a red, a, a section with red, section blue, section red. These are actually called block copolymers. Now block copolymers are fascinating in that if I attach this molecule to this one in a way that it can't come apart, it's covalent, then which of these two dominates in the behavior of this assembly here? What's shown here is which of the two dominates in terms of when you crystallize it or take it into the solid state, does it form spheres? Does it form cylinders? Does it form lamellae? And if one of the materials forms that, what does the other material do? Does it go along for the ride or does it assert itself? And that's really a function of how you build these segments in the first place, how long you make these, 
relative to the other, what kind of solvent you use and what kind of temperature you use. A fascinating area of block copolymers. We don't have time to go into it now, but I am gonna show you how this has been so instrumental in forming nano objects. Here we see a block copolymer, let's call this the B phase, which has formed cylindrical domain and the A phase has just filled in between it. We're gonna treat it with a form of energy, either a radiation or heat, which dissolves away that continuous phase. And what does it leave behind? It leaves behind just the, the, the spherical phase. It leaves behind nanoparticles, in fact. And are these of an arbitrary size? No, they aren't. They're all of the same size. And where does that track back to? That tracks back to the block pole polymer that this was originally formed from. And this size here, we have exquisite control of because of the talent of polymer chemists. Likewise, we can dissolve away the continuous phase. Oops, excuse me. We can dissolve away the nanospheres and leave the continuous phase. And what do we have here? We have nano holes. We have nanopores. You can think of it as a membrane or as a filter. And we did that again by selectively reacting the, pore, the, the spheres away from the continuous phase. Are these arbitrary size pores here? No, not at all. Again, they were very intentionally designed by the molecular weight of this red component. Oh, um, Dr. Fromer, I'm so sorry, I don't want to interrupt you, but you asked us for a five minute um, reminder. And I have five minutes left, huh? Okay. Yeah, because we started five minutes late. So I have 10 minutes late left. No, uh, no you have, yeah, five. Okay. I'm going to zip along. Sorry, I, sorry I didn't want to interrupt. But yeah. <laughs> I asked you to, Diana. Thank you. Yeah. I just wanted you to see what those instruments I showed you earlier, how they render this PowerPoint chemistry. We often do PowerPoint chemistry and things look idealized. But in this case, in fact, the atomic force images do mirror quite closely what it is the PowerPoint chemistry conveyed. These AFM, this is an AFM lever with a tip. It's had a bore driven through it so that it can now be used as a liquid delivery system. And I'm gonna move quickly. And in this way, you can see that the AFM probe can now be used to deliver fluids. And it can be used to create patterns that are unusual, that are not regular patterns. Why would you wanna draw grids like this? For example, the reason that we did this, and this is a pro, this was a, a program we had with UC Davis supported by the Gordon Moore Foundation. We did this at a scale that we could trap cells and by virtue of the entrapment, we could change their behavior. That same probe was used to deliver a precursor to copper. It was a copper sulfate solution. And by applying a bias to that tip, as we deposited into that copper sulfate solution, we also reduced and formed copper wire. This is copper wire that's 800 nanometers to five microns across. You can use this tip in a heated mode. And in this case, we're using the tip of an AFM as a volatilizer. This polymer here tends to unzip. And so we're using this heated tip to selectively take material out of this thin film. If that's called a subtractive process as opposed to an additive process. And where's the molecular control here? We've intentionally chosen a polymer that we know responds to heat by vaporizing, vaporizing cleanly. And here we're gonna use that tip in a similar material called a molecular glass to remove in 120 levels and create the Matterhorn. This was done by colleagues in Switzerland, no surprise. And here they've extended it to include the whole world. Fascinating article, you can find this in science. Finally, nanoscale manipulations, nanoscale, nanotechnology. What good is it? The goodness of it is the badness of it. The goodness of it is that it operates on the nanometer scale, but the badness of it, the detraction is that it's so localized that will it ever become commercially feasible? Well, one of the ways to make this still exquisitely well resolved feature by feature, but have it operate over larger scales is to make vast arrays of these tips. And that's what you see here in a cartoon. It was made by IBM Zurich Research Labs. Each of these AFM tips is heated and it is creating features on a surface. They're all connected though, and they're being moved. But what is a, just as much a challenge as doing this nanotechnology under each tip is being able to connect to each of these tips 
with the electronics and to operate them independently. So it's a field not only for chemists in controlling the materials, but it's also a field for the electrical engineers and the physicists and the mechanical engineers to all work together to come up with this chip, these kinds of devices. This one was made in order to be a storage device where each hole that was punched was a zero and each lack of hole was a one, a one zero storage device. Okay, my penultimate slide right before my thanks. This might be somewhat self-serving. This is a profile of me that was created on silicon. Once again, the makers of this picture, this profile, congratulatory profile, which is about one micron across. They're from Asylum Research in Santa Barbara. They created this in silicon oxide that they grew off of a silicon wafer. In other words, by oxidizing a silicon wafer in air where it could grab oxygen from both the water and the air, they created this portrait of me as a thanks for an award that I won. So chemistry in action here. <laughs> Finally, I would like to thank Diana in particular. You, uh, you're a miracle miracle person in pulling this off. I'd like to thank my colleagues at the IBM Research Labs, both in Almaden and Zurich, of whose studies I showed many results today. Also the University of Basel, they're the ones with the happy face. And indeed they made me very happy for the years I was on the faculty with them. Uh, UC Davis, they were the molecular ink deliverers. Caltech, that was the DNA origami. And as you'll hear a lot of today, we couldn't do it. We scientists couldn't do it with our, without our families, our friends. And as I'm learning now, without my students and mentees who are giving back to me by teaching me these days, as I hope you all will. Thank you for your attentions. Thank you so much, Dr. Fromer. That was an amazing talk. And, you know, I, Dr. Fromer thanked me. So I just want to, you know, take the time and thank everyone who helped them as well, you know, with team, uh, team collaboration. Um, so maybe we can take like two questions and then um, we'll get started with the next speaker, Dr. Terry Odom. Any questions? If you have any, don't hold back because we want to get started. So. Okay, I'll save my questions for... Oh. Uh, Dr. Fromer, if, if you saw, Mark asked how long it took for the picture of you to be made. Um, not very long. These, in, you know, I, and I'm, I'm hedging here because I don't know the exact answer, but these instruments work at a scan rate of over a hertz, for example, and that was probably 256 by 256. So maybe a little bit slower in order for the oxidation process to take place, but it probably didn't take much more than a few minutes. Oh, wow. Things okay. happen fast on the nanometer scale. You don't have that many items to oxidize. <laughs> For sure. All right, if that's all of you, yeah, the audience questions, I'll hand it over to Sophie and we can get started with Dr. Terry Odom.